follow along as I read from Luke 21, 37 and following. And every day he was teaching in the temple, but at night he went out and lodged on the mount called Olivet. And early in the morning, all the people came to him in the temple to hear him. Now the feast of unleavened bread drew near, which is called the Passover. And the chief priests and the scribes were seeking how to put him to death, for they feared the people. Then Satan entered into Judas called Iscariot, who was of the number of the twelve. He went away and conferred with the chief priests and officers how he might betray him to them. And they were glad and agreed to give him money. So he consented and sought an opportunity to betray him to them in the absence of a crowd. This is God's word. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Uh, I had an insight about child psychology uh, not too long ago. Now, it's not really an insight. Uh, it's quite obvious once you hear it. Um, but it's, it's, it's this. What makes a movie scary? What gives um, a movie a certain edge? And I didn't realize this. Maybe it's because I was exposed to uh, bad movies at a young age. Don't do that. Uh, but I didn't realize this, but it's the bad guy. The bad guy is what makes a movie scary or gives a movie a certain edge. And the way I realize this is, is that, is that um, when I'm watching what, what in all appearances does not look or feel like a scary movie to me, uh, some, at times the children would leave the room all of a sudden, and it would only be when the bad guy comes on screen. Aha, that's why this movie is scary, because the menace comes from the bad guy. That's my insight. But this idea comes, uh, carries over to the rest of our lives, not just in our movie watching. The idea that the bad guy is out there somewhere, right? The bad guy is someone we ought to avoid and stay away from. We rarely ever consider ourselves the bad guy. Now, should we? Well, what does the Bible have to say about it? Well, there is capital T, the bad guy in the Bible, which is Satan, right? And Satan, according to the Bible, is out there, right? One of Satan's many names is the evil one which is virtually synonymous with bad guy, right? Jesus even teaches his disciples, he teaches them, he, he teaches the disciples and us to pray, deliver us from evil, or that, that word evil can be translated, deliver us from the evil one, right? We are taught by Christ, not only to pray for deliverance from Satan, but to resist him and stand firm against him. Satan truly is the evil that we must resist. But what about Judas, such as in today's passage? Can we also dismiss Judas as a bad guy? Just as we think about Satan as someone we gotta resist, should we also think about Judas in the same way? Like, Lord, protect me from traitors and backstabbers like Judas. Is that the only way we ought to think about Judas? Shall we shake, when we read this passage, shall we just shake our heads and, bad guy, say, what a shame, and then think no more of him, dismiss him. I suggest to you, and, and, and the reason I'm preaching to you today is, no, we ought not think of Judas that way. Judas was not an out-of-the-ordinary sinner, a particularly evil person. Now, surely, we have to 
we can, we can admit his sin was great, right? Because he betrayed the Son of God. He betrayed Jesus. But Judas was a human being, just like you and me. And he was a follower of Jesus, one of the 12 disciples. He was a follower of Jesus, like all of us who confess the name of Christ. And yet, how great was his fall? So, shall we dismiss him with a wave of the hand? We shouldn't. Because Judas is a cautionary tale for us. As the Apostle Paul puts it in 1 Corinthians 10, 12, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. If you think you're standing, be careful, because you might fall. In the same way, let us take heed. Let us take heed, heed the warning that is present in this story so that we will stand and not fall like Judas did. Now, uh, let me give you some background information here in chapter 21 to 22. You may have noticed in this section of Luke that time has come to a crawl. And, the, and what I mean by that is, look, we're in, we're in the beginning of chapter 22. Um, back in chapter 19, 22, 21, 20, four chapters ago, the triumphal entry into Jerusalem was four chapters ago, and that was on a Sunday, Palm Sunday. And yet, here in chapter 22, only about two or three uh, days in real time has passed between chapter 19 and 22. And in the next, God willing, in the next few weeks and months, uh, as, we, as we cover the rest of Luke, uh, time will slow down even further as Luke really gets into the details about what happened on Thursday night, Friday. You guys know what happened, right? The crucifixion, right? So time is really going to slow down as, as, um, as Luke narrates the final day and the final hours of Jesus' life. And why this focus on the last week of Jesus' life before the crucifixion? Uh, this is intentional, right? Because it's because Jesus' crucifixion and his resurrection are the central act of salvation that he came to accomplish, Right? He didn't just come down to be one of us, although that was part of it. He, he humbled himself by becoming a man, but he humbled himself even further to the point of death. That was why he came all the way down. And, and that was the primary reason for which he came. And that is why the Gospels devote so much time to to, the, to, to his, Jesus' last week, the days and the events leading up to his death. And so, what was he doing right up until then? Verse 37 tells us, every day he was teaching in the temple. We've already pointed out how Jesus' activity in the last few days of his life demonstrates his heart to minister to others. But, I think, but there's a, something else that stands out to me here. If you only had a limited amount of time left in your life, what would you do? Now, maybe each of us, we might have different answers, but what would it, what's in common between all our answers, it would be what we think is important. What you value most in your life, that's what you would do in the last few days of your life. And you can see here for Jesus, what's important to him? teaching every day in the temple. And I think what that shows us is that learning, learning from Christ is what's important in the Christian life. Being a disciple, after all, the word disciple conveys being a learner. If you are a disciple, you are learning from your master, from your Lord, from Christ. So my point here is that to be a Christian is that you must be a lifelong learner. Now, this doesn't, 
I'm not saying that you've got to get a seminary education at some point. I'm not saying that, but it means that you must, being a Christian means sitting at Jesus' feet and learning from him day in and day out, right? The baptism class is not, you know, we have, we have a class that we offer if you want to be baptized, right? That is not the, the only, that's not the end point of your learning when you become a Christian. No, that's just the beginning. But we are called to continue in our learning. Just as we are called to pray daily, we are called to give thanks to God daily, we are called to deny ourselves and to take up our crosses daily, we are, we are also, I think here, we are called to learn, which, is, which means to sit at Jesus' feet daily. Um, that was what he was doing at, in the days. At night, in verse 37, we're told that Jesus went out and lodged on the mount called Olivet. Uh, just a quick note here. What this means is either he camped or he stayed at someone's place on, uh, on the Mount of Olives. The Mount of Olives was probably around a kilometer away from which is about a half a mile or so away from the walls of Jerusalem. So he stayed local. And we're told in verse 1 of chapter 22 that the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which is called the Passover, was drawing near. That Passover meal would take place on Thursday night. All right. So, some, so in this paragraph, it's before Thursday night. And remember, the Passover night would be his final night before his crucifixion because he would be crucified on Friday during the day. And so hopefully next week we're going to talk more about the Passover itself. In the meanwhile, this is something for us to keep in mind. Jerusalem, whenever there was a feast, Jerusalem would be filled with pilgrims, right? Because in the Old Testament, when you, when you celebrate a feast, uh, the main one being the Passover actually, you can't just do it at your home. If you lived in Galilee, no, you had to go to the temple. That's where you uh, celebrated the feast with all the people. And so there would be pilgrims from all over Israel gathering in Jerusalem, right? So you can imagine the city was, was packed with people, faithful Jews who came in order to celebrate the Passover. And we're told here in verse 38 that early in the morning, all the people came to him in the temple to hear him. And all the people here is not just the residents of Jerusalem, but it's really all of Israel at this point, because all of Israel has gathered to celebrate Pass Passover. They're in the area, and they hear about Jesus, and so they're flocking to him. Now, you can, you can see from this passage here that the vast majority of the people were eager to hear Jesus. Many of them were hopeful that he is the promised Messiah. But the religious leaders, namely, verse 2 here, the chief priest and the scribes were seeking to put him to death. Now notice how Luke puts it. He said, Luke, this is what Luke says. They were seeking how to put him to death. They weren't debating at this point whether or not they should put him to death or what steps should we take with him, this is a problem. No, they've already made up their minds. We're gonna kill him. They're, all they're talking at this point about is the details. Let's, they're hatching a plot. And the reason that they're hatching a plot is that they're, they fear the people. Meaning the people, the people who are flocking to hear him in the mornings, they think that Jesus is a prophet. Many people believe he's the Messiah. And so they don't want to uh, kill him in front of people. They don't, want to, they don't want to draw attention to themselves because the crowd might turn against them. So that's why they're plotting. As Matthew's gospel in Matthew 26 puts it, they plotted together in order to arrest Jesus by stealth and kill him. But they said, not during the feast, lest there be an uproar among the people. We shouldn't do it now during the Passover because there's too many people here. There's going to be riots. Uh, we got to do it. We, we got to do it some other time. Now let's pause here and think about this for a second. 
the people doing the plotting, doing the, this conspiracy here, these are not common criminals. These are not even secular government authorities. These are the religious leaders, the chief priests, the teachers of the law of God. These are the ones administering the temple. For example, the high priest is the only one who's ever allowed to enter the inmost, innermost sanctuary of the temple. The innermost sanctuary is called the Holy of Holies. And only one person, the high priest, is allowed to enter there on the Day of Atonement once a year. These are the people who are charged with the spiritual leadership of the people of God. You can imagine, every time they got together, they began and closed their meetings with a prayer. They knew their Bibles inside and out. And yet, here in this one verse... They're explicitly breaking at least two commands and probably other commands as well. For example, which command are they breaking? We, we, we already talked about this earlier today. They're, they're breaking the sixth commandment. They're, you shall not murder. They're plotting murder. But also they're breaking the ninth command. Um, part of their plot is to falsely accuse Jesus and the ninth command says, you shall not bear false testimony against your neighbor. Well, two commands. Explicitly, they're plotting. But also, they're probably breaking the first and tenth commands. First is, you shall have no other gods before me. And implied in that command is that we should fear God only and not fear people. And you see here the motivations for plotting for conspiracy is because they fear the people. And also the tenth command, you shall not covet. Well, they covet Jesus' um, respect and honor that he's getting from the people. That's part of their motivation. They don't like that Jesus is getting all this attention. They, and so that's part of their motivation for murdering Jesus. Now, we mustn't overlook the warning that is here in the example of the religious leaders. How easily we can wear the cloaks of religiosity, or for myself, of religious leadership, to justify our unrighteousness and guilt. But in fact, if you are a religious person, if you are a religious leader, like, such, such as myself, that only intensifies the guilt. Because if you have access to the things of God, that means you have a greater responsibility to live according to the things of God. Can you imagine? Let's think about this for a second. These chief priests and scribes, these teachers of the law, they're opening and, and closing their meeting about, in which they conspire to kill the Son of God by praying to God. They began their meeting by praying to God, and then the, and then the, the content of their meeting was conspiring to kill that same God to which they prayed. This is how very misguided and self-deceived they were. Yet, there's an there is a warning here for, to us. We must not imagine ourselves immune to this kind of self-deception and hypocrisy. This is, this is reason, this is cause for us to pause and consider ourselves. Don't just dismiss it and be like, well, that's, that's people like them. But let's move on from the religious leaders to Judas. Verse 3 says, Then Satan entered into Judas called Iscariot, who was of the number of the twelve. He, that is Satan, went, excuse me, not Satan, Judas. Judas went away and conferred with the chief priests and officers how he might betray him to them. Now, who is Satan? Uh, just a quick biblical overview. Satan is the, is the serpent from Genesis 3. And this is corroborated by the book of Revelation, in which Satan is depicted not just as a snake, but as a great dragon in Revelation. Satan, recall what Satan did in the beginning of Jesus' ministry. You guys recall that Jesus was driven into the wilderness and he was tempted by Satan. For 40 days. 
Satan, we've already established, he's called the evil one. Uh, in the Lord's Prayer, deliver us from evil can also be translated, deliver us from the evil one, deliver us from Satan. What is Satan trying to do? He actively seeks to undermine Jesus. He actively seeks to undermine the kingdom of God. He is against God's kingdom. He seeks to damage the faith of believers. He seeks to lead our faith, lead us away from the faith. 1 Corinthians 4, I believe, says he he blinds the minds of unbelievers. In other words, all this to say, Satan is a powerful enemy. And yet, Satan is not all-powerful. On the one hand, he is a powerful enemy, but on the other hand, the Bible teaches, he is not all-powerful. Satan's influence, his temptations are not irresistible. In other words, if he has his target set on you, that doesn't mean you're doomed. Otherwise, why would James, Peter, and Paul, three different New Testament authors, why would they exhort Christians, us, to resist the devil? Three different New Testament authors tell us to resist the devil. Because it's possible. Now, putting all this together, we can affirm two things. Satan is real, and he played an active role in the events leading up to the crucifixion. And yet, Satan's active role does not absolve Judas of guilt. They're both true. Satan played a role. He was was there, tempting. And yet, Judas is not innocent or faultless. He can't say, the devil made me do it. That doesn't mean that he's, he, he can't say that he's not responsible. Because even as our passage says, Satan entered into Judas, we have to understand that Judas had made his heart a welcome environment for Satan. Judas had made his heart a welcome environment for Satan. I'm reminded from Ephesians 4, which says, this is sort of an unrelated note, but the Apostle Paul in Ephesians 4, he says, be angry and do not sin, Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. In other words, there are are ways we can conduct ourselves in which we are giving opportunity to the devil. There are ways that we can conduct ourselves in which we are blocking the door. No, you're not welcome here, Satan. We're not giving him a foothold anywhere to grab a hold of us. But in Judas's case, it's very clear that he had made his heart a a welcome environment for Satan. Judas neglected to be watchful against Satan. Judas failed to resist the devil, what James, Peter, and Paul all tell us to do. And for that, that is the reason Judas is accountable. He is responsible for betraying Jesus. None of us can stand before God and say, the devil made me do it. Even if the devil tempts us, nevertheless, we still have the free will to resist the devil. So then, now that we have that answered, the question still remains, why? Why does Judas betray Jesus? Yes, we understand he's under the influence and the temptation of Satan, but but personally for Judas, what's in it for him? Now, we only have a few bits of information uh, from the Gospels. In John chapter 12, when Mary, the, the, the sister of Lazarus, anoints the feet of Jesus with this expensive ointment, that scene gives us a little window into Judas's mind. In that scene, Mary... I don't know if you guys are familiar with this passage. He, she, this is a, a, a lavish display of love toward Jesus by Mary. And how does Ju- Judas respond to this? Not, not soaking it in. Wow, this is this, how much Mary must have loved Jesus. No, 
his mind, he, he, he thinks, why was this ointment, this very expensive uh, perfume, why was it not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? He's, he, he, he jumps right over to the calculations. And we're told further in John 12, he said this not because he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief. And having charge of the money bag, he was a treasurer of the disciples. He used to help himself to what was put into it. So we, we know from John 12 that he was a thief, he was greedy, that, uh, that even in such a moment like this, when someone displays such lavish love for Jesus, uh, his mind automatically goes toward uh, calculations, toward money. Certainly not a, not a flattering picture of Judas. So perhaps, perhaps this is the reason why he betrayed Jesus. He was motivated purely by greed. But I don't think we can, we can say that with absolute certainty because the Gospels don't really talk about G Judas's motivations. They, they don't really talk about that. What we do know is this. Judas betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. There was this deal that the, the chief priests and the scribes had with Judas. 30 pieces of silver. And even though we cannot pinpoint his motivation with, with pre precision, we know this is we can we can tell we can say this judas definitely had other priorities in his life that were more important than jesus other priorities for which he was willing to sell jesus we can establish that now judas stands as a stern warning to all of us if your response after reading this is, I would never, then that is a sign, perhaps, that you have not sufficiently heeded the warning. That's, that's, going, back to, uh, that's going back to the First Corinthians passage, passage. Let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed, lest he fall. The, now, what is the warning here in the passage? In Judas's example, there are three distinct yet very related warnings that are here in, in the passage. So let's go to them. First, proximity or nearness to Jesus is no guarantee of a regenerate or born again heart. Let me say that again. Nearness to Jesus is no guarantee that you are saved. Consider this, Judas was one of the 12. So for close to three years, Judas has been living in Jesus's immediate presence. He's been eating with him, drinking with him, traveling with him. He's seen, Except for like a, a few scenes, like for example, when Jesus went up the mountain with, with, the, with the James, John, and Peter with the transfiguration. Except in a few of those scenes, he's been there with him the whole time. Jesus, excuse me, Judas was there, for example, when Jesus calmed the storm. You remember that scene? He saw and witnessed, he experienced the fear of, dr of drowning on the Sea of Galilee, and he saw Jesus tell the wind and the waves, be still. He saw that. He witnessed countless times when Jesus healed the sick. He healed the lame, the blind, the deaf. He's seen Jesus many times raise the dead. He's seen Jesus exorcising demons out of the demon possessed. He's heard the message of the gospel, the good news. He heard the Sermon on the Mount probably several times. By the way, in the gospels, the, many of the sermons Jesus told, he probably told them several times. He heard the Sermon on the Mount. He, told, he heard the parables. Not only did he hear the parables, he, he heard the explanations that Jesus gave about the parables that he only told the disciples, remember? parables sometimes he would he would say the parables to the crowds but to the disciples he would give the meaning of the parables he heard the meaning too judas was there 
whenever there were the, the showdowns between the Pharisees and, and, the, and Jesus, he was there where he witnessed all these, uh, these confrontations. He saw Jesus always taking them down. Judas was there. He saw Jesus' mercy and his compassion. He was no stranger to Jesus' tenderness towards sinners. He heard that invitation, come to me all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Judas heard it many times. But perhaps he thought it was enough to just be there, uh, to have heard those words, to have witnessed the power and grace of God, and that's good enough. But again, exposure and proximity to God's words and his mercy and grace, that's not the final step. All those things are meant to compel us to put our faith in him. And just as with Judas, how many people, for example, grow up in the church, know the gospel inside and out? They have an experience of God's goodness and his power. And then at the end of the day, they walk away from it all. If it was possible for Judas, it's definitely possible for us. You just only need to think of Think a little bit, and you know people who've done this. It's a warning to us. Second, the example of Judas highlights the dangers of hypocrisy. And what do I mean by hypocrisy? Hypocrisy is, is focusing on the externals. The externals are what we can see, what other people can see. Focusing on the externals to the neglect of what's inside, to the neglect of your heart. That's what hypocrisy. So a hypocrite can know all the right things. They can even do all the right things. They can say all the right things. But the hypocrite's eyes are ultimately not on Jesus, but on himself. The hypocrite plays the part. He looks the part, but it's not real. The hypocrite does not have true communion, true fellowship with Jesus. There's no desperation for Jesus. I need you, Lord. There's no brokenness for Jesus. There's no humility before Jesus. There's no hunger and thirst for Jesus. There's no grateful confidence in the promises of Christ because the hypocrite ultimately trusts in himself. Only God can see into your heart, right? We know that. Only God can see into each of our hearts. But God's omniscience, the fact that only he can see into our hearts, that is supposed to compel us to, or it's supposed to put before us the fact that we stand before him bare, we stand, quote-unquote, naked before him. He sees us as we really are. We are laid bare before God. We cannot hide from God, right? Because he sees us truly, perfectly. And that's why we need Jesus. But the great danger of hypocrisy is forgetting that God sees Forgetting that God can see and really focusing on this minor detail that no human can see into our hearts. Aha, no human can see into my heart. That means all I need to do is focus on the externals, what's on the outside, my words, my behavior. And so we can make our religion about what's external, about our appearance, about looking and playing a part, all the while forgetting the most important thing, that God looks into the heart. And in Judas's case, I'm sure he looked and played the part, he sounded the part, but his heart did not love Jesus. And third, 
third warning for us is that our hearts, our hearts deceive us. Our hearts lie to us. Self-deception goes hand in hand with hypocrisy. Because if we focus on the externals, on appearing a certain way, rather than being a certain way, as we neglect our hearts, whether we're truly resting in Christ, if we're thirsting and longing for Christ, we can easily deceive ourselves. We easily take confidence in things which, in which we are not meant to take confidence in. Like the fact that everything seems okay on the outside. But, as the scriptures teach clearly over and over again, but the prime example is Jeremiah 17, which says, the heart is deceptive, kind of? The heart is deceptive above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? See, for Judas, think about him. He didn't think that he was sinking down a path further and further to, to the point of no return. Not that there is ever a point of no return. You can always repent. But he didn't know that he was sinking down this dark path. Right? Who knows what the initial seeds for his, when the initial seeds for his dark plan were planted. But when those seeds were planted, he didn't think it was dangerous to keep thinking about it. Mull it over in his, in his mind. He didn't think it was dangerous to neglect resisting the devil. Perhaps he deceived himself into thinking, well, I can change my mind later. Well, let's see what happens now. I can change my mind later and keep going down this path. Or perhaps he said to himself, I can ask for forgiveness later. God is merciful. I can ask for forgiveness. And we know that Judas did not ask for forgiveness, actually. Even though he could have, he didn't. Imagine what kind of justifications and excuses he came up with each step of the way. Again, our hearts deceive us. Our hearts provide all kinds of justifications and excuses for our sin. Our hearts are naturally defensive about our sin. And so don't listen to your heart. Right? Don't listen to Disney. You guys know what Disney movies say, right? They say, listen to your heart. Don't do that. Don't listen to your heart. Don't follow your heart. You heard it from me. Our hearts lie, but Jesus doesn't. We are faithless, but Jesus is faithful. That means we shouldn't trust ourselves we ought to trust Jesus. So hear again Jesus' words to us. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Jesus says, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall never hunger, shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Friends, hear Jesus' invitation to you. You can trust that unlike anyone else, you, you got to suspect their motives. With Jesus, you don't need to suspect his, his motives. He hides no dark purposes toward you, but he extends to you eternal life. He extends to you true blessedness, communion with the living God. Trust not in yourself. Trust not in your own heart. Trust not in the promises of the world. Trust not in the temptations of the devil. But turn, turn to Jesus, rest in him, receive him, and you shall be saved. Let's pray together. Lord, indeed, as we consider Judas, 
We see what a tragedy it is, Lord, that to us it appears that he was so close to you, and yet he was so far. And it is a warning to us, Lord, may we heed this warning so that when the day of temptation comes, Lord, that we will stand and not fall. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's all stand. Respond. This this song of of uh, God's mercy to us. Our sins are ever before us. They are exposed. But God being merciful through Christ saves us from our sin. Let's think about that. Let's sing this to ourselves, to our hearts. Sing it to each other. Let's praise, praise God through this song. Dwell in me. Thy 
my salvation's joy in part. Steadfast make my willing heart. Sinners then shall learn from me and return, O oh God, to guilt remove and my tongue shall sing thy love touch my silent lips O Lord and my mouth shall praise a our triune God. People of God, receive the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Please be seated. Uh, just a few quick announcements. Uh, today is January 1st, as you already know, but 